So I had to ask myself the question, why am I alive? Why am I here? And it occurred to me, I would like to help others find their purpose. I want them to fulfill potential. My life would have a meaning if when peace meets me, she knows her purpose. Because I know when you know your purpose, you come alive. You have no time to be nasty. You have no time to beef another woman. Mm -hmm. You are too busy about your own business. Ola Jumoke Adenowo is a Nigerian architect, speaker, host, philanthropist, and author. CNN has described her as Africa's star architect. She has been featured in the world's most foremost architectural journal, architectural record, and has spoken on several high profile platforms, including the Global Women's Forum and Harvard Business School. Adenoa studied architecture from the age of 14 at the Obafemi Awolowo University, graduating with a BSc Honours in Architecture and coveted faculty prize in 1988. She subsequently obtained a first distinction in the MSc Architecture in the history of the university. Two things stood out. First, that my parents are academics. And two, that I was an only child for so long. So it made it very different. It was a lovely childhood. I was very close to my parents, I still am, and um, I went everywhere with them. So it was different in that way. What were you like as a child? Were you quite uh, talkative or were you very quiet? Were you quite timid? What was your personality well, Nothing like? has changed. I'm still as talkative as I was. <laughs> I remember being very talkative, so I think I'm, I'm a bit better. And my father would encourage me to speak, you see, to speak up. So from as early as three, I knew my opinions mattered and it asked what I thought. Now when I think about it, talking to a three-year-old is rather funny, but I do remember that, you know, we'd go for trips together, he'd ask me what I want, what I thought about this, and, you know, I'd ride in the car and I, could, I couldn't see beyond the dashboard. But then we'd talk, we'd listen to the carpenters, we'd sing. It was fun growing up. I was very secure mm -hmm. in my parents' love. They had their issues, but in their love, I was secure. Was there any type of career path that they wanted you to toe the line or was there any, I know growing up in, on the continent they always mm. tend to lean towards being a lawyer or a doctor or those professions. Oh, you, they... <laughs> you know what saved me from that? A professor of history and a professor of criminology have no right telling anybody to be a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer because they didn't go that way themselves. So I could be anything I wanted, though I thought I wanted to be a doctor for a long time because I was good in the sciences. And in those days, you know, you're good in the sciences, you're a doctor, full stop. But I was creative too. So there was a lot of tension in me. I was good in history, in literature. I was the best. And then in physics, it wasn't computing. So, but architecture was that niche, that mix, that put everything together, where you can be totally rounded and, you know, it works. So they supported me to be anything I wanted to be. How did you go from being a young child to have, finding a love of architecture? Because it's, it's quite a unique field to be in. Um, how did you develop that? How did you find that you had a skill or a it's, talent in um, the area? Okay. It's not even about a skill, it's about a passion, a real burning passion to design. So at about three, I told you I was an only child. So I think my parents took me along everywhere because there was nobody to dump me with, that's the real truth. So we were in Paris and we we're doing a tour of Europe. And I, would, I was at Palais de Versailles. I saw the Notre Dame. I saw the Tour Eiffel. You know, there were buildings that had such a huge impact. I was, of course I was so short, I was three. So it, everything was blown out of proportion to me and had such a huge impact on my life. Buildings. So I discovered that I was fascinated with buildings, space, design. So I would sketch buildings, I would sketch furniture, I would sketch the only thing I can design are automobiles. I'm not, I don't like to design cars, but I was always sketching, I was always drawing, I was always creating. I like the idea that something suddenly exists when nothing existed before. And then order comes out of chaos. And for me, that is architecture. So you've managed to make your name as one of the foremost architects on the continent. Um, do you ever realize or reflect on how far your career has gone? Was that ever the plan to become one of the most powerful architects? And I say powerful because your following alone is, is not the usual for someone in your field. 
Thank you. You're so kind. <laughs> My following. Mm -hmm. To be very honest, to be very honest, I have underwhelmed myself. Mm -hmm. You get that? Why? Um, maybe because I was so precocious. You know, and it's very difficult for people to understand what, what precocity sets you up for. It almost sets you up. You are too hard on yourself. When you're at university at 14, if you're running at that age, you think you should be flying by now or something, you know, so you expect. I'm very grateful for where I am. I'm more grateful for the people. It has brought me in touch with people like you, people all over the continent, the impact, because I think people are really beautiful. And that's what my job has led me to, to meet people and get involved with them. But when it comes to how far I've come, I'm grateful, but there's so much more I want to do that the environment is so constricting that does not allow me to do, but that's a conversation for maybe later. The way architecture is viewed, the way women and architecture are, what Nigeria feels about architecture, even Africa as a whole. I could do a lot more well, actually, and I would like to. I love what you've just highlighted because um, there are a lot of um, misconceptions. When you think about architecture, it's usually quite a male-dominated industry mm, on this side exactly. of the world. Um, in terms of your journey from the genesis, how did you actually find yourself in this field? And what experience was it like building up such a powerful name? It was normal. I took it one day at a time. But I decided to always follow my instinct. When I was in practice conventionally working for someone, I found I couldn't express myself the way I really wanted to. So there was nowhere else but out. I didn't step out of the firm I was working with then because I wanted more money. I wanted more expression. I wanted to be me. I didn't want to be stifled. I wanted to express, I wanted to birth what I carried. And there was no way in the environment I found myself, it was constraining mm -hmm. and I had to. I didn't know this is where it was taking me. I would have done things a bit differently if I knew we we're going to come this far, that 24 years later, I'll still be there. I probably would have structured things better from the very beginning. What I've done, I would have told my younger self to do it differently. But that's what it was. I just wanted to express. And that is what took me on this journey. So I've been evolving. So the vision remains the same, and the, but the methods change. I'm very passionate that the world should hear about what Africa has to offer in architecture. If you look at it, you cannot be a star architect, globally recognized and accepted by the architectural establishment, if you didn't study in one of the schools they've endorsed. So here I am, studying in Africa, practicing in Africa, speaking outside, out to, from Africa. You just don't do that. The architectural establishment, which is actually very Western, yes. very male, you win their prizes you before they tell you you can now speak you know this is very different from say african music that's populist you like the sound you dance to it there is no establishment that tells you now you can dance that's right tap your feet it's okay we endorse the music but architecture is different regardless of what the people think there's actually an establishment that tells you in language that nobody understands that it's all right she's now an architect we recognize her you know, and I realized that Africa has been very kind to me because it's the African people who have embraced me. It is the African people who have said she represents us regardless of what you think. Yeah. So I think for the first time, a very elitist profession is suddenly becoming populist because yeah. people understand my architecture. People get into my studio and they gasp. They get into our buildings and they like it. They're not waiting for someone to tell them that it's okay now. You can honest. gasp, you know? <laughs> so that's it. We have a story as architects, you know, as African architects. There's something about African architecture. It's sustainable. It, ref, you know, it reflects the zeitgeist. That's the spirit of the age, the aspirations of the people. You can't tell my story for me. My architecture is my identity. When you look at Black Panther, when they were hovering over Wakanda, the king goes, or the king to be goes, this never grows old. What he's saying is that when I get over my landscape 
all of a sudden I know I'm at home. But what do we have right now in African architecture? Look at Lagos. It could be the backside of Dubai. It could be Sugarland in Texas. There is nothing that says when you get to Lagos, I am in Lagos. It just shows people are trying all over the continent to mimic what the colonialists, you know, are doing now. So we have a chip on our shoulder. It's, we're insecure and it's showing. I would like to be remembered as an architect who helped define what a modern contemporary African architecture should be because it is too core to our identity. It's as core to our identity as the melanin in our skin. It's something we have to sort out. Adenauer mentors and develops young architectural talents through her firm AD Consulting's internship scheme. AD Consulting has received several awards for design excellence and is Nigeria's most internationally awarded firm. One thing that I noticed when I was looking at everything that you've built, I felt that you are a face and a voice to those who are voiceless in this industry. And you do show, especially young women, that it is possible. But for you, those young women that are looking to follow in your steps, how did you start? If you can give us kind of a step-by-step -step almost overview through your studies and so on and so forth. How did you manage to create this voice mm. in this area? I'll say, how did I start? It was passion that led me out, really. I just wanted, I was with Femi Maja Kudumi Associates, as it was called at that time, and my boss is still so good to me. It was so good to me then. And he told me, you are the best designer I have ever come across. And at that time, he was the president of the International Union of Architects, the first black president. And he knew all the architects, everybody. And he said that. So it was so encouraging to me as a young 22, 23 year old working with him. But I wanted to express more. I was restless. I wanted to do more. So I started my own practice in a very tiny office in Onikon, about the size of yeah, this. And I just wanted to design. And that's how the journey started. I made my mistakes that I don't want the young women to make, you know, along the line. But I evolved month after month, day after day. There were hard times, you know, because I have no godfather. My parents are intellectuals. You need to get the work in. Mm -hmm. There was no business development office. That was everything. The how did you manage to secure those contracts? <sighs> It was pure grace and favor, and that really is it. And my talent spoke for itself. So once in a while, you do come across the odd African who actually wants someone talented to do the work, especially in their enlightened self-interest. People use me to do their work when they realize that it's in my best interest to let her do it. That's just it. Because if not, the way decisions about architecture are taken in Nigeria, it's more like, do you have a brother who can do it? Go bring him. Mm. It's nothing to do with who is the best because people do not know the difference between building and architecture. It's true. I think there's more of a creativity to one than the other, right? Good. Architecture is not just about function. It's not about shelter. It's distinction. It's about my persona. It's about the way I want to be seen. Mm -hmm. So my company is Google. But I want the campus to distill the essence of what Google is. Mm -hmm. It's not just a shed to house people to work. So it's my house, my residence. But I want you to say something about me. You know, it's that billboard for the company that does not go away. It is a marketing interface. That mm -hmm. is what architecture is. It is about my brand, corporate or personal. And it's about a legacy that never fades. That is what architecture is. That's what the pharaohs wanted to do when they built the pyramids. It was a brand statement. We're here, we're going nowhere. And you know what? They are going nowhere. 4,500 years later, you are talking about them because they built monuments. Mm -hmm. Architecture is not building. And because we're still at that rudimentary level, architecture is struggling in Africa. How have you managed to get past the um, perceptions of what a woman should do? What I do daily, really, 
is I, I do the best possible I can at all times. And then I've satisfied my conscience. So when I'm done designing, I look at it and I've criticized it myself. I'm hard on myself. I ask the questions the client may want to ask and several more. So by the time they're asking me that question, I'm like, that's the solution. That's the solution. I thought of that, it wouldn't work because. So there's that. When I'm done, whatever you decide to do after that, I know this work will stand anywhere in the world on if there was a level playing field. I'm satisfied. Has there ever been a point in your journey where you thought that you're, you would face one of the most difficult experiences as an, a female architect? Was there any ever experience that you went through that you thought, I'm not going to be able to survive this? I, did I do the right profession? <laughs> Have you ever had those moments? Because you're very strong and very solid. Every year. So. The, really? My close <laughs> friends know every year I go, I'm not doing this anymore. It's just not working. What's the point? <laughs> Nobody understands what we're doing anyway. Because it's true. Hardly any, we, the payoff for AD Consulting is designing for the discerning. Because it takes an actual discerning person who knows the difference between a mere building and true design yeah. to come to AD Consulting. You know, if you're going to take some brew and you're going to take vintage wine, you need a palate that knows you just don't want to quench your thirst. You know, you want something beyond mere function. And those are the clientele that we cater to. And because a lot of the critical mass are not there, yes, every year I get to the point I say, you know what, especially for a woman, this isn't working. And then I say, I'm going to give up for some minutes. And then I get back up. What makes you keep going? Because I feel I have something in me that I've not yet delivered. Yes. Really? Oh, definitely, oh, peace. I haven't oh, even goodness. started. Oh, That's the way I feel. <laughs> I definitely haven't even started. I have something to do. I am on a mission and I'm not there yet. I'm beginning to get there probably, starting to move in that direction, but I'm definitely not there yet. Phenomenal. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you did mention that you had um, a vision for what you wanted to do to architecture in Africa. Talk to me more about that passion. Beautiful. What would I like? I would like to be a voice for African architecture. I want African architecture to be respected for what it is. Right now, it can't be because what is African architecture? Nothing. Nothing. When we talk about African architecture, we're not, I mean, Africa is not homogeneous. But there is a thread that runs through everything we call African traditional architecture. There's a thread. We're expressive in architecture. So an Indebele house has painting all over it. It's not restrained, it's not just quite. You know, there's, it's, it's communal. It expresses our aspirations, our thoughts, who we are. You know, it's responsive to the climate. You, you understand, it works. It's sustainable, you don't have to cool an African house or heat it. You know, it all works with the climate. These are lessons that right now, right now with the sustainable de development goals, we should all be learning from African traditional architecture. So we as architects on the continent should be having this discussion right now. What are going to be the typ typical markers of African architecture? There are buildings right now in Lagos, Peace, that you cannot open the windows in the heat in Africa. With what power is doing in Nigeria? So you're on generator 24 seven. You know what? It's in the best interest of the entire globe that Africa finds its voice and its confidence in its own architecture. Because if we house the numbers who need to be housed, if we take care of the commercial activities that need to be taken care of, housed, in this continent, in the next 10 years, the way the West has, if we do not leapfrog in our own technologies by getting confident in what we have, we will kill the planet. Adenawa has been outspoken about taking pride in her Nigerian heritage and her hopes to unleash the potential of Nigerian youth. Her passion to improve the lives of Nigerian youth led to the establishment of Awesome Treasures Foundation to address the education gap for inner city kids while continuing to improve Nigeria's architectural landscape against the odds. I think it's quite interesting that you're also talking about not just even 
as we stand here mm -hmm. today in Africa or the continent, so I say, or the globe, but also you're talking about the future. Yes, the future. And I know from a lot of your work, you are actually a mentor to so many people. Um, some that you're aware of and some that you have no idea. Oh, Vent, you really do mentor to so many people. You're a very powerful voice. Um, how important is it to you to help the youth in becoming the best they can be for tomorrow? It's the way, it, it's just, I don't know who said this, but it's so true. What we have right now is not an, it's not an inheritance from our fathers. It is a legacy we've borrowed from our children. We all must make sure that we leave the planet better than we met it. That should be my footprint on the planet. And as a woman, maybe for me, I don't even see business or entrepreneurship about just the bottom line. Yes, the bottom line, you don't need to take a look at it because you can't help the poor by being one of them. So you need to make sure that your business works. However, I believe till our leaders in Africa get to that point that they understand that the peoples of Africa are the real human resources of Africa. Not the gold, not the oil, not the copper, not the tin, the people of Africa. It's left to we as entrepreneurs to develop human capital. So I don't see my team or my staff as just staff or team. I see them as mentees. I see them as my charges to develop and release back to society. So I cannot help being generational in my thinking or nurturing. I'm a woman, that's what women do. And that's what I want all women in business to take away from this kind of episode. We must realize that the future of the continent depends on us and we cannot be like mere men when we do things. We have to be generational in our thinking. If men are thinking of the next quarterly report and the next AGM, women should be thinking of generations to come. That's why we're women. We're men with the womb. We nurture the next generation. We are the ones who are charged with developing the next generation of Africans and we must step up to the table. You have truly stepped up to the table. You've actually founded Awesome Treasures Foundation, which is really focused about building transformational mm, leaders. Yes. Can you tell us more about that, please? In 1999, it occurred to me that I'd done everything I was told to do. Well, go to university, we did. Well, you really should get married, you know? I got married. <laughs> I was very happily married, no complaints. I had the African boy, I had a son, and I was restless. And I would hear everybody complaining about stuff. This is nothing is working. Somebody should do something about that. Somebody should do, then it occurred to me one day, I am somebody. I can't tell somebody to do it. I should go do it. It is better to light a candle than to cast the darkness. So I started to talk about it. I started to have meetings about it. And before I knew, 5,000 youth were gathering, and it was becoming like that. And I was talking to youth about what they're gonna do for their country, about patriotism. I would let them rant, you know, insult my generation. We'll have interactive sessions that would tell us off. And then I bring them gradually to that point that they realize that you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. And so a lot of the youth have gone on to political office, to music, to entertainment, to, 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 to the arts. We, we got them to understand that leadership is influence and not elected office or appointment. Leadership is using your voice to galvanize the critical mass towards a preferred desired goal. And they caught it. And the women to catch it. And we've got stunning testimonials. I think your accolades really speak for themselves. They're extremely well deserved, but you have a plethora of them Thank that you. you've acquired over the years. Um, when I look at who you are today, it seems almost effortless. You really have, I said it before the interview, that you have an air of grace because you're so strong and you really own your own presence. In terms of overcoming difficulties and failures, have you experienced any epic failures and how have you managed to overcome them? You know, failure is relative. Failure is when you set a goal and you don't meet it. If that is what it is, I would say I still had one on Sunday. So it comes <laughs> with the territory and it's just the truth. And it's my faith that keeps me going. Right. You have to believe that there is more to life than you. Yeah. I find me too small to serve. I find me too small to please. I find me, I just don't compute 
in the whole scheme of things. I think that only a life lived for others is a life worth living. And at the end of the day, nobody's going to remember you for anything but the impact that you made in their lives. There will always be a richer woman or a richer man. They evol it evolves daily within, with the NYSC and every just, you know, just that changes. What does not change? is the good you deposit into another's life. And that, that's what keeps me going to my faith. It's a real strong belief that I'm here for a reason. And until I'm done with that reason, I'm going nowhere. It's about significance. You want to make, create a legacy, then get ready to work really hard. Hard work is not a bad word.